And uh, thanks to Stephen, Anthony and Juliana, the invitation to Elizabeth, Lynn and myself to speak at Dark Archives 2020 and for organizing such a terrific program in such trying circumstances. Now, I was fortunate enough to attend and speak at last year's inaugural conference. And the presentations and discussions were incredibly stimulating and exciting. And already this year, we know it's gonna be no different. Obviously, we're all just sorry to be missing out on a couple of nice days in Oxford. Now, last year's conference, I floated to Stephen the idea of a presentation by the Beyond 2022 project in the knowledge that the substantive research packages would be underway by now. And so here we are. Now, I don't think any of us could have predicted the restrictions placed on access to archives and manuscripts during the coronavirus pandemic. And this has served both in academia and among the wider public to bring the transformative potential of digital technologies and access solutions into sharper focus. Now, this conference is largely focused on the medieval unread and unreadable. And as I suggested last year, there remain vast archival collections beyond researchers' view due to their scale, their condition, or even, in some cases, the apparent lack of interest to scholars. But today, we want to talk about the challenges faced by researchers where a national archive has been almost entirely destroyed and to offer some insights into the potential of traditional and digital methodologies to reconstruct much that's been destroyed. Now, on the 30th of June, 1922, cataclysmic fire destroyed the public record office of Ireland. The ashes of more than seven centuries of records were scattered across Dublin, leaving the nation, nascent Irish state stripped of much of its archival heritage. Now, our presentation today will briefly introduce this historic tragedy and the modern project to recover much of what's, of what's been lost. But we'll mainly focus on what we are calling the medieval exchequer and gold scenes and the project's knowledge base, which Elizabeth and Lynn will discuss in much more detail. And then we'll conclude with some thoughts about the future of this project and the potential wider applicability of both its outputs and methodologies for the wider digital humanities field. First, save you from listening to me waffling on, our project partners at MoHo in Dublin prepared a video which gives you a better idea of the Beyond 2022 project as a whole, and I'm going to ask Lynn to play that now. Dublin, June 30th, 1922. Day three of the Battle of the Four Courts, the opening engagement of the Irish Civil War. Shortly after noon, the city is shaken by a huge explosion. After the blast, fire takes hold and plumes of white smoke are seen billowing from an arcade of tall windows in a corner of the Four Courts complex. This is the record treasury of Ireland's public record office. Irish history, dating back over 700 years, is on fire. Inside the record treasury, the intense heat melts the high ironwork galleries and shelving casting paper and parchment records into the flames below. Miraculously, one part of the building survives almost intact, except for a blast hole in the side wall. The record house, and at its heart, the handsome search room where researchers pored over historical documents had escaped the worst of the damage. Now, supported by the Government of Ireland, the Beyond 2022 project is reconstructing the search room in virtual reality. Here, readers in 1922 conducted their research beneath the natural light of a beautiful glazed ceiling. And for the first time in a century, we can reopen the double doors that led to the record treasury, passing through the fire break, which stopped the blaze spreading to the front of the building. On the centenary of the fire, Four steps will take you on your journey through Ireland's virtual record treasury. Explore, locate, connect, discover. Entering through the record house, you can admire its elegant staircase before passing into the search room where your discoveries begin. From here, you can search the archive and travel to the very place in the lofty galleries of the treasury where the records destroyed in 1922 have been reassembled from surviving copies and transcripts located in archives across Ireland and around the world. Now, next generation technology enables you to visualize the whole archive and make connections in ways that were unimaginable a century. Returning to the search room, you can discover more about the people, places and topics contained in the documents. Beyond 2022, 
unlocking the story of Ireland and its peoples across seven centuries and reopening a lost archive to new generations with new questions. Thanks, Lynn. So, um, as you've heard, funded by the Government of Ireland and under the direction of our, our colleague, Dr. Peter Crooks, Beyond 2022, Ireland's Virtual Record Treasury is a multidisciplinary project based at Trinity College Dublin with numerous international partners, including the National Archives UK, National Archives Ireland, the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland, and the Irish Manuscripts Commission. Now, as you can see in this schematic, it aims to reconstruct the PRLI and its lost collections through a variety of work packages and engagement strategies. So Archival Discovery, for example, aims to identify and digitally reunite surviving originals with an ever-increasing cache of transcripts, inventories, and indexes in archives, libraries, museums, and even in private hands across the world in preparation for enhanced digitalization and then restoration to their shelves in a virtual reconstruction of the building. The ambition is also to exploit AR and VR technologies to provide access to these newly digitized collections in new and innovative ways. And so to put a bit more technical flesh on the bones and let you see sort of what's, what we're planning, you can see here that there are various core project deliverables. The, the most important of which really is this inventory of loss and survival, which will be a database. And you know, it's based on what we know was in the, within the archive at the time, and what we're trying to reconstruct. There'll also be a large collection of digital images from archives of core partners and participating institutions. And there will be searchable content across manuscript and text records. We estimate that to be around 50 million words at the moment, although that's ever growing. Lynn will discuss the knowledge base for Irish history shortly. And Elizabeth will discuss some of the initiatives we're, we're um, moving towards with our digital text editions using technologies such as TEI, methodologies TEI and XML. And then as I say, we're going to have this 3D immersive experience using AR and VR to give the public a real a sort of archival experience. The main overarching ambition, though, is to be open access and online and this trusted digital repository. And the government of Ireland are putting an awful lot of financial support in to make this a sustainable resource for future generations. Now, underpinning all of our work of recovery and reconstruction is what's been described as the saddest book in Irish history. This, as you can see, is the guide to the records deposited in the Public Record Office of Ireland. Published by, uh, by Herbert Wood, Deputy Keeper of the PROI in 1919, it documents in rich and now quite harrowing detail the records transferred into the Record Office from government departments since its opening in 1867, just three years before the overwhelming majority was obliterated. Now, taken with evidence from surviving increment books, Wood's guide as you can see here, is even allowing us to place the records back on their correct shelves in the virtual record treasury, even those going back 700 years into Ireland's medieval past. Now, while many reconstructions can only be at fonts level, top level, several gold themes which aim to reconstruct lost sources even to item level have been developed. And I'm now going to hand over to Elizabeth to tell you more about the medieval exchequer gold theme, the focus of our talk. Thank you, Paul. So what I'm going to do now is talk to you about the medieval gold theme exchequer and why it exists. There's the record, the gold, the gold theme of the medieval exchequer records are the records created by the Irish Financial Administration based at Dublin Castle, covering all the activities of the English state in Ireland from the 1270s right through for our purposes, the 16th century. This huge, but there's this huge archive of material which was then transferred to London, and I want to explore the processes that created that shadow archive now in London. The Dublin Exchequer was intended always to handle all the revenue and all the expenditure of the English state in Ireland, so it was entirely separate from the English Exchequer based in London. 
but a series of accounting scandals and money going missing and various other irregularities at the end of the 13th century forced the English government to rethink that plan and mandate that the records created by the Dublin Exchequer should be checked in London. And what I've shown you on the screen here is the process of that checking, of gathering in money, of writing the records, of checking it, and the guide of procedure, the Red Book of the Exchequer itself in the middle there. And you can see there the roles that were produced by that process. But fortunately for our purposes, one of those records, one copy of those records was sent to London. And there's, there's a very real materiality to this process. And um, here you can see the pouches, that one of the pouches that was used to, tr to transport records from Dublin to London, which is now in the National Archives collection, still holding its original records from the 1290s. Ironically, one of those disputed and controversial set of accounts that forced the setup of the London accounting process. And we know quite a lot about how they travelled from Dublin to London, including the route that they tended to use, which was still the same route as you can see here on John Ogilvie's map of Britannia, showing the very last, very first stages of the route from Dublin to London after you get off the ferry in Hollyhead, sh showing the route through the North Wales Mountains to Chester and then from Chester to London. And we know details of the kind of effort that went into this because we have the £32 that was paid to a messenger for two years' work going between Dublin and London carrying this sort of material in the 1270s. We also have an indication occasionally of how long it took. There's a writ that was issued in London on the 28th of July 1290 which reached Dublin at the ninth hour on the 17th of October, but just, just under two months later. So there's a constant process of communication back and forth, bringing these copies to London. And what happens when they reach London? Well, the English Exchequer, which we know was based here, um, just off New Palace Yard in Westminster, in the two towers on either side of Westminster Hall. Uh, the upper exchequer, which is responsible for order and for checking accounts, is based on the one to the left of your screen, um, and they have further rooms to the left still of that image. But when the documents reach London, the English exchequer takes those accounts, takes any supplementary material that they've asked for and rechecks them. So goes through and line by line makes sure that they're happy with the account, queries anything that they're not sure about, and they produce what's known as enrolled copies, which are absorbed into the English financial um, records. And once, that, once they're satisfied with the process of audit, the records are stored with the other exchequer records in and around London and Westminster, from which they will later be quite literally in some cases excavated in the 19th century to be, to be moved to the National Archives now at Kew. So what we have here in this mater very material process of record creation is the somewhat accidental creation of a shadow archive in London, which duplicates and checks and summarises the work that's already been done in Dublin by the Dublin Exchequer. And thus we have this extraordinarily rich three centuries and more of material that tells us exactly what was in the public record office when it burned in 1922 relating to the medieval Exchequer material. So what can we do with this material? Lynn's going to talk more about this in a moment, but I want to emphasise how even just one of these records can start giving us interesting details for beyond just the um, 
the process of the Exchequer into starting to think about the social history of medieval Ireland. This is one account from the 1270s. It covers 1270 to 1272, when James de Audley is waging, as just a seer of Ireland, is waging various campaigns across Ireland. And you can, and among the many things he is accounting for, we can see purchases of food and horses. We can see who these things are being bought from and the prices paid, which can be built into larger stories about um, consumption and um, trade networks. But we can also see really interesting things about the people active with Audley at this time, including, interestingly, Irish men working with the English government in Ireland against other Irish um, communities. And I like this one because it's, um, it's a reminder that this is a part of a much wider world and a much wider um, Plantagenet set of enterprises because in the 1270s, so before the English conquest of Wales in the 1280s, there are Welsh mercenaries acting with Audley and we can see payments to them. So then we'll build this into a much bigger picture of how we can use these individual details to start telling a very wide and expansive story of, um, I, of, I, of medieval Ireland. But the last thing I want to talk about is how we're going to turn this digital edition into that larger picture. So we're going to use TEI to mark up our transcriptions and translations so that we can start linking these data together. So, you know, we can find every mention of the Welsh and Ireland across these centuries. But we're also going to, we're starting to use Transcribus to train um, these models, not to read the medieval handwriting, but to read 19th century transcripts, because uh, there's a whole, huge series of material that was transcribed by the Irish Record Commission in the 19th century. And you can see an example on the screen there. And if we can train transcribers to extract that information, then we can start doing um, automatically what otherwise would have to be done manually. So I'll now hand over to Lynn to talk to you about how we're going to build all of these data points together into something that's searchable and usable more broadly. Thanks very much, Elizabeth. Um, so yeah, this is taking it, as Elizabeth said, to a little bit more of a meta level. Uh, it's introducing another aspect uh, of Beyond 2022's project, uh, uh, digital humanities uh, endeavor that we're working on. Uh, so for this section of the talk, I'm going to be uh, discussing some of the work that has gone on behind the scenes in designing what we call the Beyond 2022 Knowledge Graph for Irish History. And hopefully I'll be able to give you an idea, a, a sense of how this aspect of the project can be used to explore the sources that Elizabeth and Paul have been talking about in a really new and exciting way. So within Beyond 2022, we're using knowledge graph technologies uh, to create an innovative method of interrogating and searching historical records right across Beyond 2022's collections. So for anyone interested in Irish history, the knowledge graph is going to be a really central element of how we can not just search and navigate historical records, but also enhance our understanding of the links between these records, um, as well as the individuals, the places and the events which are contained within them. One key contribution of the knowledge graph, for instance, uh, will be to provide authoritative identifiers for entities. So with this, I mean people, places, events, organizations and so on, which are mentioned within the collections process by Beyond 2022. And by doing this, uh, we can enable seamless linking of knowledge about people and places across multiple collections, uh, both within and beyond the virtual record treasury across nearly seven centuries of the island's history. Now, one thing that I should highlight from the outset uh, is that the development of Beyond 2022's knowledge graph has been a truly interdisciplinary exercise. It's the product of very close collaboration uh, between the project's humanities team and the computer science team. Um, 
like Elizabeth, I'm a medieval historian, so uh, I'm not going to attempt to speak uh, to the highly technical aspects which underpin uh, the knowledge graph and its technologies. But for anyone who's interested in learning more about our work on this, uh, you should definitely check out the videos on Beyond 2022's website. These are produced by Dr. Christoph de Bruyne of the ADAPT Centre, who is our resident knowledge graph genius uh, on the computer science team. Now, Christoph and I have been working closely together over the past few months to develop the knowledge graph. Uh, some of the challenges we faced, for instance, are finding a way for computer scientists uh, to provide adequate tooling and representations, which will allow historians to contribute to the knowledge graph. Um, finding ways to transform the representations that we as historians use into a meaningful knowledge graph. Um, and crucially, to support the uh, to organise the knowledge graph to support various use cases, various historical scenarios, things that will be encountered within the historical record. Um, what we needed to do, though, uh, in developing the knowledge graph, we uh, to work through all of these challenges um, is historical data. And this is where for me uh, as a medievalist, uh, things got particularly interesting uh, because the data that we used as a test case was drawn from the index of Philomena Connolly's Irish Exchequer Payments published by the Irish Manuscripts Commission in 1998. Uh, the source itself um, is a published calendar of the payments made by the Irish Exchequer between 1270 uh, and 1446. So these uh, records of the Exchequer are available to us uh, already in print format and the records that Elizabeth and I will be editing over the next two years uh, will complement these records, of course. Um, these payments were originally recorded on the Irish issue rolls and treasurer's accounts. So what in essence we're seeing on screen is the same type of information that we've seen in the documents uh, Elizabeth has, has shown you contained in a different format in a published book. Um, and as Elizabeth said, these kinds of uh, financial records are Im an immensely valuable historical source in their own right. They're full of information on exactly the sort of um, data that we need to create the knowledge graph as well. So this is names, locations, dates and so on. One thing I do want to mention um, is that while this case study focuses on the medieval exchequer records, the schema, um, the technology, the concept behind the schema that we've been developing is adaptable. It's intended to be used to collect data not just from medieval, but also early modern and modern sources too, um, and thereby explore uh, all of these connection collections and link them together. One of our first uh, challenges was in taking the very rich historical data con contained in the print source and transforming this into a format which Dr. Christoph de Bruyne could use to populate the knowledge graph. So the computer science and humanities team uh, worked together to design a spreadsheet schema. We can see this on the right hand side of the screen. Um, and this um, is designed to capture the information contained uh, in this case within the Irish Exchequer Payments Index. The idea behind the schema is that it allows us to enrich and contextualise the data found in our historical records. Um, we do this by inputting data into various predefined categories. Uh, we have names, date ranges, occupations, social status, gender and so on. Um, it also allows us to begin to link these individuals to one another to uncover patterns and relationships that might not otherwise be apparent or might take a very long um, process to to uncover through using uh, our traditional research methods going through our documents one by one reading through them. Um, it's also important uh, to note that for historians or for anyone already familiar with these printed sources, uh, a lot of the historical meaning contained within this data, uh, say within the index, within these documents is implicit. Um, so one of the key challenges for us uh, associated with capturing the data and uh, representing it in an enriched form was to make explicit for computer scientists and indeed for the knowledge graph itself, the kind of information that we as historians take as implicit, the connections, the context, the subject matter experts will already know or infer from reading a text. So what would this might involve is capturing variant spellings of names 
uh, so that we can identify where the same individuals appear in multiple records, but then they might be recorded with the name spelled differently or perhaps in a different language. And this kind of endeavour is what will give us the ability to link multiple records across Beyond 2022's collections uh, and provide explicit meaning to them uh, for the user. The spreadsheet that we can see here uh, as, our, as our test case contains very rich historical data on over 2000 individuals mentioned uh, in Phil Connolly's Irish Exchequer payments. So my role at this stage in the project was to fill in this data manually and enrich it as much as possible with historical information from other sources. So taking as well uh, and incorporating resources like the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography and the Dictionary of Irish Biography uh, in here too. In the future, it will be possible to draw much of this information automatically from digitized records. So those that Elizabeth and I will be editing using TEI uh, and so further letting us link multiple records across the collections. Now, what I want to do next um, is give you a brief glimpse of uh, one product of all of the work behind the scenes. So taking a look at a demonstration of the knowledge graph in action. Uh, the following short video was created by Christophe de Bruyne. Uh, it showcases just one example of what the knowledge graph can do. So um, as Elizabeth mentioned, we can use the reconstructed records of the medieval exchequer to explore the social and political history of Ireland. And I'm particularly interested in the networks of individuals who worked within the medieval English government in Ireland. Uh, hopefully this video will show you uh, how the knowledge graph can help us to explore these records. Um, when Christoph and I were testing it, I suggested that we do a search using offices. Uh, my, my theory was we find a lot of rich connections between individuals who might have held the same office in the medieval period. Um, so what you're actually seeing on screen at the moment, Christoph has searched using offices and he searched for treasurer of Ireland. And already we're seeing a huge amount of individuals. We can't actually see all of their names, but we can see that a huge amount of individuals within that one data set, that spreadsheet, were listed as treasurers of Ireland. But it gets a little bit more exciting. So we can add another search term. This is what Christoph has done on screen, added Chancellor of Ireland, and again, another high profile position. So within the Exchequer records, we naturally have a lot of individuals who have been identified as chancellors. What we cannot see though um, is connections starting to emerge between these individuals. And what we're actually seeing at the moment on screen, just in the very center there, is four individuals who have both held the position of Treasurer of Ireland and of Chancellor of Ireland. So this is the knowledge graph, just drawing that out that information and putting it together visually for us. We can take this another step further. Uh, Christoph is now searching for uh, Justitia of Ireland. So this is the top English government official in Ireland. This is uh, the man who is representing the king in his absence uh, from the medieval colony. Um, again, this is a figure who we'll, we'll encounter uh, regularly. Uh, an office that we'll encounter regularly in our records. And we can see a whole host of individuals uh, that have been identified within this particular data set, these 2000 individuals mentioned in Irish Exchequer payments. And quite excitingly, I think in the very middle, uh, we can see just one individual within this data set who has been recorded as holding all three positions. Um, during this period. So it's amazing just to be able to extract that level of information uh, searching if we can compare it to the process that it would take us to, to refine that level of information by, by searching through our records. Um, and, and of course, these connections will only become more meaningful the more data that we actually include within the knowledge graph itself. Um, obviously, um, this is only one small example of what we can do with the knowledge graph uh, as it's in development at the moment. Uh, in the future, um, we're, we're currently working on linking uh, person, uh, organization, office entities uh, to geospatial data as well. So this will allow us to explore place uh, and find out, for instance, as you can see on screen, a list of individual offices uh, who are associated with one location, Dublin Castle. And of course, this has a, a clear uh, resonance with uh, our work on the medieval exchequer um, and its close connections to Dublin Castle in this period. More broadly speaking, though, what I think the knowledge graph uh, can really offer uh, to both specialists and non-specialists um, is that 
it's not just presenting historical data in a new way. It's also got huge potential to stimulate new research questions for us. Um, it's uh, allowing us to conceptualize historical data in a new way. Uh, it can reveal to us previously unseen relationships and connections between people, places and organizations, as we saw in the video, uh, offices, uh, which would not necessarily be apparent otherwise. Um, and again, the crucial thing is that it will facilitate linking across multiple types of historical records across traditional uh, chronological boundaries um, and, and bring these connections together. So I'll leave it there for the knowledge graph, uh, knowledge graph and I will pass back over to Paul. Thanks, Lynn. Thanks, Elizabeth. So just to conclude, the, the devastating physical losses in 1922 obviously can't themselves be recovered. The genius of Beyond 2022 and its collaborative multidisciplinary framework is that we can conceive and deliver a surrogate virtual archive using digital tools and methods in time for the centenary commemorations in 2022. The clue to the future is also in the title of the project. The aim is very much that we're at the start potentially several decades of work, both to continue populating the record treasury and sharing its riches as widely as possible, and to use it as a platform for extending what has already been possible. Now I'm thinking here potentially about future funding for other gold seams, and with luck for us, this might include an extension of our work, which has obviously only just begun on the medieval exchequer, and an examination of the memoranda rolls, for example, where there's 50 plus volumes of 19th century transcripts, of which in the National Archives of Ireland which document the daily financial proceedings of the English government in Ireland across three centuries. We're thinking maybe of pairing that with developing the knowledge graph, and that will hopefully enable us to look at big trends and enhance the scope of the research questions around the social history of Ireland and the changing reach of pre-modern English government in medieval and early modern Ireland, as Lynn and Elizabeth have outlined. Now, some of our work with handwritten text recognition software on creating models for passing Latin abbreviations and creating expanded transcriptions will potentially contribute to generating reliable translations and further expanding the taxonomies of medieval records at our disposal. Now we hope at least some of our research approaches and digital techniques that we're developing will provide scalable models for recover recovering other archival losses around the world. Finally, as we hope is evident, the resources aren't simply being created for the academic community. This gold seam and other aspects of the project will make the entirety of the lost archive and its diaspora accessible and useful to non-specialists and interest groups alike, and all interest groups alike. So I guess the message is to try and keep up to date with the project website and to get in touch with us at any time to share knowledge or to ask questions. So we'll leave it there. Thanks for listening. And I guess we now move to questions. Thanks.